Welcome back, ladies and gents. This is Chapter 22, The Respiratory System, Part 1. Um, in this chapter, we're going to explore all the different organs and structures that contribute to our respiratory system. We're also going to look at different aspects, such as what exactly controls when the lungs can inflate and deflate, um, the role of alveoles and gas exchange. Uh, can oxygen, carbon dioxide, and pH have an influence on our respiratory rates? And oh yeah, we're also going to discuss the fact that when it comes to breathing, we can control it both on a conscious and an unconscious level. So before we get started with all that fun stuff, let's go ahead and just take a look at the main items that are involved in the respiratory system. So go ahead and take a look at the picture that is on the right hand side and locate the nose, the pharynx, which is in the back of the throat region, the larynx, which is more commonly known as your voice box, your trachea, which is your windpipe, and then obviously we're going to have to take a look at the bronchioles, which are the divisions that come off the trachea, and finally we'll have the lungs that will surround the bronchial tree. Now, when it comes to the respiratory system, oftentimes you'll notice that they'll divide it into the upper and lower respiratory tract. The upper respiratory tract will be any of the organs or structures that are found within the head and the neck section. So we're thinking um, our nose, we're thinking about our pharynx, and we're thinking about our larynx. The lower respiratory tract will be in the thoracic cavity. So that basically means the trachea, the bronchioles, and the lungs will fall in that particular division. As we're perusing through the chapter, you're going to notice that the concepts will kind of guide you as to what the airflow is in the lungs, meaning how do we actually get atmospheric air into our body, and as it's traveling through the different organs and structures, how does it eventually make its way over to the bronchi and the bronchioles, which are going to be the smaller windpipe divisions, into our alveoli, which are going to be our little respiratory buds. These are going to be the functioning unit of the lungs where the actual gas exchange is occurring. And as this discussion of airflow will follow, you're going to notice that you can go ahead and talk about what they uh, refer to as the conducting division and the respiratory division. The conducting division is going to be more interested in exactly how does air travel. So when you take a deep inhale, what cavities, which organs, which structures are we introducing as we're flowing from the nostrils over to the bronchioles? The respiratory division is when you actually start discussing your gas exchange. So if you now are able to bring the air over into the lungs, into the alveoles, how exactly do we drop off our oxygen and pick up our carbon dioxide? Now, what I would like to do for the first part of the chapter is I'd like to look at the main structures, and let's go ahead and not only familiarize us with the name, but also take a look at what they actually contribute to the respiratory system. So let's start with the nose. Now, anytime you think about the nose, I think a lot of us will be like, okay, it helps us smell and detect odors, and you're completely correct with that as well. But it also turns out that the nose will be able to warm cleanse and humidify any of the inhaled air that's introduced into our system. And it turns out that by warming and humidifying the air, it actually makes it easier for the lungs to expand, thereby increasing the amount of gas that you can exchange at the functioning level. The nose itself is going to be a combination of bone and cartilage. So you can see on the illustration that I have highlighted for you that the top part is composed of nasal bones. So we're thinking back to our 2085 course when you learned about the facial bones. And then the mid part, on the I'm sorry, excuse me, the middle and the bottom part of the nose is going to be composed of cartilage and connective tissue. So on the illustration, you're going to notice that in the blue sections of the nose are highlighting the lateral cartilage and the alar cartilage. That's basically the part of your nose that you can wiggle side to side. The tip parts, the flared portion at the bottom um, that's indicated by a pink color in our illustration, that's going to be dense connective tissue, and that particular section is going to be called the ala nasi. Those are going to be the flared edges on each side of the nostril. 
Now, inside the nose, we're going to have the nasal cavity. And within the nasal cavity, we're going to have a septum that basically divides the right and the left chamber. The chambers are called nasal fossa. And what we're going to have in there is we're going to talk about the fact that you have different types of tissue folds and you're going to have tunnels that are going to help you warm and humidify that air. But I'll show you those pathways in just one second. I want to show you the term vestibule on this PowerPoint. The vestibule is going to be the chamber that's inside of the ala nasi. Remember the ala nasis are the flared portions of the nose. So the chamber that it houses, um, for lack of better terming, this will be the area of your nose where you go and you pick your nose. That is going to be called the vestibule. And the vestibule is really important to highlight because oftentimes it's filled with Febreze, which basically are guard hairs. So little nose hairs all over the place. And they're going to serve a very important function because they're able to trap any type of pathogen that tries to make its way into the nasal cavity. And then oftentimes it gets wrapped around with mucus, which then becomes the quote-unquote boogers that we're cleaning out of our nose. So in this illustration, you can see what I've highlighted for you is I've highlighted for you the anterior nares or nostrils on the left hand side. And if you look over to the right hand side, I've highlighted for you the posterior nares. So those are the opening and the ending part of your nasal cavity. And you can see right there by the dilated chamber on the side, you have your little vestibule and then you're going to have your guard hairs. Now, your entire nasal cavity is also composed, as you can see, the nasal chondria. We're going to take a look at what those folds of tissue actually contribute to the whole process. So the superior, middle, and inferior nasal chondria, these are going to be three folds of tissue. And what we see happening is that they will be filled with different types of blood vessels. And these blood vessels will engorge through the tissue folds, allowing us to warm up the air that we're inhaling and add some, um, able to humidify it as well. We see that these folds have lots of mucous membranes, and because they're engorged with blood vessels, we often see that if there's an injury to it, it can be causing a nosebleed. In fact, for many of us, if we've ever experienced a nosebleed, it's because there's been some type of injury to the inferior nasal chondria, which then allows us to bleed outside of the nostrils. Now, in between the folds of tissue, you're going to have narrow passageways, little tunnels. Those are going to be called your meatuses, and the pathway is where the air is going to fit in and how it's going to be interacting with the chondria, the folds of tissue. And as the air travels through the passageway, it interacts with the chondria, the folds of tissue, and it interacts with both the mucous membranes and the veins and arteries that are involved, allowing the air to become warmed and humidified. Let's go ahead and take a look at an illustration so we can kind of have a sense of air coming into the nasal cavity and interacting with both the tissue and the air passage. Okay, so we're back to our original picture that we looked at for our vestibule and for our nostrils. And what we can see here is within the remainder of the nasal cavities, I went ahead and I put a box around the nasal chondria. And as you can see, there are three folds, superior towards the cranium end, middle being the middle, and then the inferior is going to be the one that is going to be closest towards your palate. Um, as you can see, the meatuses, the passageways, the openings, are also labeled superior, middle, and inferior. So try to visualize air flowing through the vestibule and then being forced through the meatuses. And as the air is passing through the meatuses, it's interacting with the tissue for the superior, middle, and inferior chondria, and the air is being warmed and humidified before it makes its way down the pharynx over to the larynx and the trachea. Within the nasal cavity, it's also very um, important to point out the fact that there'll be lots of mucosa. Mucosa can have several functions. It can contribute to your overall olfactory senses. It can help with the respiratory sensation um, or function. 
of the system. But the more important thing is to realize that anytime you come across the term mucosa, you're looking at cells that have the ability to produce mucus, primarily from goblet cells that are embedded within the tissue. And mucus is an excellent example of a primary defense because it will go ahead and trap and wrap itself around any type of foreign pathogens, thereby immobilizing them and obviously making it harder for them to spread into the rest of the body. Keep in mind that your nasal cavity is one of the orifices of your body, so it needs all the protection it can get to prevent any type of abnormalities from entering into the system. We also see that oftentimes the mucus will have access to production of lysozymes, which are enzymes that are very effective um, in destroying bacteria, cell walls, and the cell itself. Within the cavity, in addition to the fact that we have our goblet cells with our muc mucosa and our mucus cells, excuse me, we will also see lots of cilia. Cilia are fine hair extensions. Um, many of us will remember it from when we did our histology section in 2085. We talked about pseudostratified epithelium, um, where the cells will appear to be in multiple layers, but it's only one layer, and that they'll have these fine little fuzzy hairs, little like peach fuzz sticking out. They tend to be found in areas that covering orifices, so the nasal cavity will fit in perfectly. And in this case, what we see happening is oftentimes the cilia will beat or sweep in unison, allowing any type of mucus particle to either be um, exited out of the system by either you sneezing um, or you blowing it out, or on the other hand, utilizing what we like to call the mucociliary escalator, which is when you take your pathogens and you move it upwards so that they fall into the pharynx, um, into the larynx, and then finally into your esophagus so it can make its way over to the stomach and it's not introduced into your um, trachea. The bottom of the slide discusses the fact that you have your erectile tissue in the inferior chondria. So this is part of what I was discussing a few slides back. The fact that inside of the nasal cavity, you have those folds of tissue that are full of blood vessels. So you can see your venous plexus, meaning a collection of different veins that are able to warm up the air as it's being introduced or shoveled through the meatuses. And then at the bottom, it also mentions the fact that the most common site of a nosebleed is when there's injury done to the inferior chondria, which makes sense because that is the erectile tissue that is the closest to the bottom of the nasal cavity. On this picture right here, it's showing you the little mucociliary escalator that I was chit-chatting about on our previous slide. So go ahead and take a look at the top picture on the right-hand side. And what you're seeing are your pseudostratified epithelium cells with the cilia. You see a mucus layer, and you can see some debris that's being laid in it. Those are the little red dots. And then notice how you have that blue arrow that's pointing upwards. And this particular escalator is going to become more helpful when we take a look at any debris that comes down by like the larynx section or even in the trachea because it will be able to trap the pathogen and then move it upwards so that we can go ahead and we can dump it into the esophagus which lies right behind the trachea so that we swallow the pathogen and it doesn't make its way down the trachea into the lungs where it can cause clinical applications such as pneumonia or bronchitis. Alrighty, so now that we've discussed the nose and the nasal cavity, let's take a look at the area that comes behind the throat section, which is going to be called the pharynx. The pharynx is divided into three sections. You have the part that will interact with the nasal cavity. We're going to call that the nasopharynx. This is where you're going to find your pharyngeal tonsils, and this one will make a sharp 90 degree drop as it makes its way over to the oropharynx. The oropharynx is where the back of the throat interacts with the oral cavity. This is usually around by the soft palate, which is the back, all the way the back of the roof of your mouth, as well as the root of their tongue. And this is where you're going to find your palatine and lingual tonsils. And the last part of the pharynx will be the laryngeal pharynx. This is where you have an interaction between the larynx um, up by the hyoid bone all the way down to the cricoid cartilage, which is going to be the start of your trachea.
Here on this illustration, we can see the regions clearly marked. So in the yellow color, we can see our nasopharynx. Notice how that one's associated with the nasal cavity. The oropharynx, which one is associated with our oral cavity. And the laryngeopharynx, which is going to be associated with the larynx, the voice box regions. I also want you to notice how the nasopharynx makes that 90 degree drop. And also that the nasopharynx will be exposed to air flowing through the nasal cavity, whereas the oropharynx and the laryngeopharynx will be exposed both to air coming down from the nasal cavity, but also food coming from the oral cavity. As we proceed with our conduction pathway, we see that we have inhaled our air, we've gone from the nose into the nasal cavity, into the pharynx, and then our next stop is going to be our larynx. Our larynx is more informally known as our voice box. What you can do is you can take your two fingers and put it in the middle of your throat, and the part that you feel vibrating when you talk, that is your larynx, that is your voice box. Um, inside the larynx, we see that we have an opening. That opening is going to be called the glottis. It's best known for the fact that that is where you house your vocal cords, but it's also the opening that will lead us eventually into the trachea, which will be our windpipe, which is one step closer to getting to the actual lungs. Now, the opening, the glottis, is guarded by this little fold of tissue called the epiglottis. And what the epiglottis does is that it basically stays open or it stays erect whenever you're inhaling and exhaling. But the minute we see that you start chewing and you get ready to swallow, the epiglottis will close off the glottis so that the food when you swallow goes behind the trachea into the esophagus and does not come anywhere near the trachea because obviously we don't want food to sit in our lungs because it can cause an infection. So the epiglottis is a full a flap of tissue that guards the glottis, which basically ensures that food goes into the esophagus and air goes into the windpipe. Now, there have been cases where patients go in and they're diagnosed with cancer in the epiglottis and they have to unfortunately remove that tissue. So then the question becomes, if I have to remove my epiglottis for any reason whatsoever, would that then mean that I'm at a higher chance of choking, that I can't control that food goes into my esophagus and air goes into my trachea? And it turns out the answer is no. You are not at a higher chance of choking if you do not have an epiglottis. And the reason for that is because your body has a backup system. It has what we like to call vestibular folds, which I've highlighted for you on the illustration. Vestibular folds are two folds that basically slide open and close. I like to think of them as a little sliding door. And they will also regulate the opening of the glottis so that when food is into the system, the vestibular folds will close off and the food has nowhere else to go but into the esophagus. Whereas when the person is not actively eating and they're just inhaling and exhaling, Inhaling, the vestibular folds will be fully open so that air exchange can occur between the trachea and the lungs. I've also highlighted for you the thyroid cartilage, and the reason I've highlighted that is because the thyroid cartilage is very sensitive to testosterone. And because males tend to naturally have a higher level of testosterone, what we see is that their thyroid cartilage becomes more pronounced. That is then what we call the Adam's apple. So in case you're wondering why a lot of guys have Adam's apples, but women don't, it's just because of the fact that they have higher levels of testosterone and the cartilage is actually responding to it by enlarging and becoming more prominent. Another interesting fact um, about the larynx is the fact that when you are younger, so um, newborn to about the age of two, it is actually possible for you to swallow and inhale at the same time. And the reason for that is all about the size of the tongue. As we get older, usually older than the age of two, we see that the tongue starts to bulk up and it actually is a massive muscle to the point that when we are chewing our food and it's moving the food around, the minute we see that we swallow, the tongue will actually inhibit us from breathing and swallowing at the same time time. And usually we don't even think about it because swallowing takes a millisecond to happen, but I have a feeling many of you are now trying to swallow and inhale all at the same time. 
Don't do it. You can't do it. It all has to do with the mass of the tongue. All right. So now we are at the trachea. The trachea is what we like to call the windpipe. It is best known for the fact that it is going to be filled with C-shaped cartilages. Um, as you're looking at the trachea, and in a second I'll show you an illustration, you're going to notice that the C-shaped cartilages are towards the front. In the back of the trachea, you're going to have a smooth muscle tube that's going to be your esophagus. That's going to lead us over to the stomach, so we'll discuss that when we do the digestive system chapter. But the esophagus will be exposed to the tracheolus, which is a muscle that will span the opening of the C-ring, and the tracheolus will allow the C-ring to basically adjust the airflow, even if there's food into the esophagus. So it will give it a little bit of wiggle room, so that if you swallow, the food can go around the esophagus, but not hinder the actual anatomy or composition of the C-ring cartilages of your trachea. Once again, you're going to see at the bottom of the slide that they mentioned for you that there is lots of ciliated pseudostratified epithelium lining these particular orifices. All right, so we've seen this picture before, but now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at it from the aspect of the trachea. So as you can see, the trachea sits right underneath the larynx. It has the C-shaped rings. And then if you go ahead and take a look at the picture that is highlighted on the bottom right, you can see that the cross-section of the trachea, you can see the cartilage, the hyaline cartilage that forms the ring. You can see the lumen, that's where the air is going to travel through. And then in the back of it, you can see your tracheolus. So that's going to be the smooth muscle that comes into contact with your esophagus. And then you can see on the top picture something that you've seen before, which is the fact that it's highlighting the pseudostratified epithelium cells and its ability to go ahead and do a mucociliary escalator so that any type of pathogens that are inhaled make their way into the esophagus or get spit out or coughed out or snorted out ooh, um, and do not make their way down into the lungs. Okay, so let's do a quick review before we keep going. So, so far we've talked about airflow in the sense of what organs or structures am I gonna hit of the respiratory system. So I added this little picture so you can follow the blue arrows and you can see that air will flow through the nares into the nasal cavity and over there it will be exposed to the chondria and the meatuses the folds and the passageway. And then it will go down to the back of the throat where we have our nasopharynx our oropharynx, and then our laryngeal pharynx. And from the laryngeal pharynx, we have to go ahead and go past the epiglottis, which is that little fat fold of tissue that's guarding the opening, the glottis. And from the glottis, we will make our way down the trachea. So the bottom blue arrow, that is inside of the trachea. And also what I want to show you is, if you're trying to visualize exactly where is the esophagus, you can actually see that it's directly behind the trachea. And obviously the esophagus esophagus will lead you into the stomach, where the trachea will lead you into the lungs. Now, once you get into the lungs, what we're going to see is that we have the right lung and the left lung, and they're actually very different from an anatomical standpoint. The right lung will actually have three lobes that are separated by little fissures, and the left lung will actually have two lobes, a very large one and a smaller one towards the base. Now, the left lung tends to be a little bit more narrow. It tends to be a little bit longer. And part of that is because it has to accommodate the apex of the heart. So think back to your cardiovascular chapter. You had the apex, the pointy section of the heart that pointed towards the left. And we see that that apex can sit in what we like to call the cardiac impression, which is a small cavity that will be able to house the apex of the heart within the lung tissue. The right lung tends to be a little bit shorter but plumper because it doesn't have to associate with the apex of the heart. And as you can see, the right lung has three lobes, the left lung has two. The number of lobes is going to be important in a little bit when we start talking about how the trachea divides and gives rise to what we call the bronchial tree. Alrighty, 
So once you get down to the trachea, what we see happening is when it encounters the lungs, and you can take a look at the picture that is on the bottom right-hand side, you can see when you get down to the bottom of the trachea, you're going to notice that it's going to start dividing and making its way over to the left and the right lung. The part of the division, that's going to be called the bronchial tree, and the goal is to start narrowing these little passageways so that eventually we can get down to the histology point of view and we can start interacting with the actual alveoles or functioning units of the lungs. So within the division, the three that are the most important are going to be the primary bronchi, the secondary bronchi, and the tertiary bronchi. And the way it's going to work is that the primary bronchi is the first division, hence the name primary, and you're going to have one to the left and one to the right. These are still going to have their C-shaped rings. So go ahead and locate it on the picture that's on the top right-hand side. You can see you have a primary bronchi, one for the left side and one for the right side of the lungs. From there on, we're going to see that the primary bronchioles will go ahead and do another division, and this will then be called our secondary bronchioles. The secondary bronchioles will divide based on how many lobes are found in the lungs. So remember how the right has three lobes and the left has two lobes. So that will correspond with how many secondary bronchioles we have. Five altogether, three on the right and two on the left. The secondary bronchial will then further subdivide into the tertiary bronchioles. And over here, we see that we get 10 on the right and 8 on the left. And they will continue to subdivide because the goal is to basically start innervating each of the individual cells within the lungs so that you can do gas exchange. But over here, you can see your bronchial tree and make sure that you can tell me that primary is one to the left, one to the right. Secondary is three for the right, two for the left, because it's per lobe. And then tertiary is going to be more segmental. It has more of an overlapping plate, not really necessarily a C-shaped ring. Those are going to be 10 on the right and 8 on the left. And if you take a look at the picture that is on the bottom right, you can actually see how the bronchial tree is starting to divide and interact with the different parts of the lungs. Now, we're not done with the division yet because we're going to need to get smaller and smaller to get to the individual air sacs. So let's go ahead and take a look at the histology section of the bronchial tree and how we're going to keep getting smaller in diameter for our gas exchange. Alrighty, so here on my right hand side, we have a nice histology picture of the lungs and you can see I've highlighted for you the bronchioles. The bronchioles are going to be further divisions or subdivisions of the tertiary bronchi. They are no longer going to be composed of cartilages. Now we're going to look at smooth muscle. And what we see happening is that they will continue to subdivide and get smaller and smaller. And as you can see on your notes, it's going to tell you that you can have your pulmonary lobule. That will go ahead and give rise to the terminal bronchioles. And finally, it will give rise to the respiratory bronchioles. The respiratory bronchioles are the smallest one that you can get to. And they are the ones that will actually interact with our alveolar sacs, which is the functioning unit of the lungs. They are little buds where you can actually do your gas exchange. So that is the point in the alveoli where you're able to drop off the oxygen and pick up the carbon dioxide. And here on this illustration, if you start looking all the way um, on this highlighted section, you can see I've highlighted the bronchioles for you, the terminal and the respiratory bronchioles. See how they keep subdividing? And eventually they make their way over to the alveoli sac, which is the whole bud which is composed of little alveoli. These are the little respiratory system gas exchange areas. So this is where you actually have dropping off of the oxygen and picking up of the carbon dioxide. Now, notice also how it has lots and lots of blood vessels that it's interacting with. And hopefully some of us are thinking back to our cardiovascular chapter where we talked about blood flow um, from the heart and to the heart. And we discussed the fact that deoxygenated blood will go ahead and travel from the pulmonary arteries over to the lungs. And when it gets there, it will drop off 
the carbon dioxide and it will pick up oxygen so that oxygenated blood can return through the pulmonary veins onto the left side of the heart and be pumped through the systemic circulation. So one thing that I want to point out here is that the lungs are going to have um, a little bit of a different type of blood pressure and lymphatic drainage, and it will all contribute to its overall function. So it turns out that the alveoli's are very gentile, they're very fragile, they're very thin. So in order to accommodate their structure and to make sure that we're not actually damaging them, we see that the lungs tend to have a very low blood pressure. So they have a very low blood pressure so that we can protect the anatomy of the alveoli's because they're so fragile. The lungs will also have an abnormally high lymphatic drainage. And the reason for that is because we want to make sure that we um, detect any type of pathogens that try to make their way into um, the rest of the body. So the blood pressure is lower than normal versus the rest of the body, and the lymphatic drainage is higher than normal. So I just wanted to kind of point that out, and that's one of the reasons why I put those two little markings on the side to remind myself to mention it to you. Now, I also want to mention that the lungs will also have a connective tissue layer that will surround itself. It will have a visceral and a parietal pleura. Um, so the visceral will be the one that comes in direct contact with the lungs, and the parietal pleura will be the outer layer on top that will interact with the ribs and the thoracic cavity. And very similar to when we talked about the cardiovascular system, we're going to see that this pleura, this protective layer, will function in reducing the friction as the lungs are inflating and deflating and interacting so closely with the beating heart in the middle. Um, it will also help compartmentalize, so it makes it harder for disease to kind of hop from one organ to the next because you have this like protective layer that's wrapped around. And it also will contribute to a pressure gradient. In a little bit, we're going to talk about the fact that if you want the lungs to inflate and deflate, you are going to have to create a pressure gradient so that air can flow from high to low, depending on if you want to inhale or exhale. And part of that pressure difference will come from the fact that it has a pleural connective wrapping around the lung tissue. All right. So pulmonary ventilation basically means one inhale and one exhale. And an inhale is basically an inspiration, an exhale is an expiration. And as many of you know, you can go ahead and you can adjust your breathing rate. So oftentimes you'll have a mention of what we call quiet respiration, which is you, for instance, hopefully now you're relaxed, you're sitting down, you're taking some notes, you're listening to my smooth voice. <laughs> This is now when you're doing quiet respiration. In fact, you weren't even thinking about inhaling or exhaling until I mentioned that now we're thinking about our inhaling and exhaling. You can also go ahead and do forced respiration. So this is, for instance, if I were to say to you, okay, go ahead and hold your breath and release it. Or I can say to you, go ahead and increase your inhaling pattern. Um, go ahead and forcefully exhale. Or when you do things like singing or screaming or exercising, this is then when we do a forced respiration, meaning we're manipulating our lungs to react either faster or slower. Either way, what's important to point out is that the lungs cannot inflate or deflate innately. So they don't have that um, capability of just contracting and relaxing by themselves, unlike the heart. Instead, what the lungs will have to do is they have to rely on pressure differences, and the pressure differences will allow the air to flow in and out, and along the way, the air will be assisted not only by the pressure differences, but also by the muscles that surround the lungs, because they will be able to manipulate the size of the lungs and thereby manipulate the pressure points that they are exposed to. Um, let me show you this on a little bit of an animation, and obviously as we proceed through the chapter, we'll get into more and more detail. But the important thing to note is that lungs do not inflate or deflate by themselves. They have to rely on a pressure difference if you want to have a good inspiration and expiration. All right, so take a look at this simplistic graphic, okay? So we have our lungs, 
indicated by the two pink sacs. And the little white circles are meant to show your inhaling and your exhaling. And that green line that's going up and down, any guesses? Hopefully you set your diaphragm. Yeah, that's your diaphragm muscle. So you've seen the diaphragm muscle before. It's the muscle that's going to separate your thoracic cavity from your abdominal cavity. And what we see happening is when the diaphragm contracts, it actually lowers. So it actually falls down. And when it falls down, look what it does to the size of the lungs. It allows the lungs to extend. And when the lungs extend, it actually lowers their pressure point making it easier for air to flow in. When the diaphragm goes back to its resting location, it kind of pops up because the diaphragm by itself is like a dome-shaped muscle. So I should see the diaphragm moving upwards. That's the diaphragm resetting to its original location, its original size. And when it does so, notice how the lungs get smaller because it's kind of like squeezing the lungs. And as it squeezes the lungs, it creates a high pressure point which makes it easier for air to flow out. Now, I'm going to discuss this in quite a bit more detail in the next part of our lecture. But for now, just go ahead and take a look at the illustration and try to uh, visualize a little bit that if I want to inhale, I'm going to need my diaphragm muscle to contract, which means it's going to fall down. And when it falls down, my lungs elongate and air gets sucked in. And if I want to exhale, that means that my diaphragm is resetting itself, so it's plumping back up. And as it's doing so, it's squeezing the lungs to get smaller, thereby allowing me to exhale the air out of my system. So this whole beating effect of the two pink sacs of the two lungs, that is not done by the lungs itself. It's all controlled by the diaphragm. And the air will flow in and out depending on the pressure differences that we're generating by altering the size of the lung tissue. All right, so let's take a look at some of these muscles that we're going to need to inhale and exhale. The main one will be our diaphragm. This will be our main controller of our respiratory rate. And as you can see from the illustration, it is a dome-shaped muscle, and the lungs will sit directly on it. When the muscle contracts, it falls downward and the lungs will extend, allowing you to inhale. And when it pops back up, it kind of squeezes the lungs, it makes them smaller, so then you exhale the air out as well. In addition to the diaphragm, you will also utilize your intercostal muscles, which are the muscles that wrap around the ribs. You also utilize your scaleness muscles. These are located towards the top of the first pair of ribs. And what we see happening is that you also have what we call accessory respiratory muscles. These are going to be muscles that are going to be recruited in addition to when we do things like forced inspiration or forced expiration. So anytime you're going to alter your respiratory rate above the normal or quiet respiration, you're going to have to recruit additional muscles besides the diaphragm, the scaleness, and the intercostals. So on your PowerPoint, it says that if I'm going to do a forced inspiration, so if I tell all of us right now, take a super deep inhale, what you should feel is that besides the diaphragm and the intercostals and the scaleness, you should also feel an interaction with your sternocleidomastoid muscle. That's that whiplash muscle that's on the side of your neck. You should also feel the pectoralis minor, your pecs contracting, and even the erector spinea muscle, which is that really long muscle that runs all the way down our vertebra. If we're going to do a forced expiration, so I'm going to ask you to do things like uh, screaming or coughing or sneezing or just forcefully exhaling, then we're going to also have to go ahead and recruit our abdominus and our latimus dorsi muscle. So we're going to use more muscles depending on if we're doing a quiet or a forced breathing pattern. I also want to highlight the fact that your nervous system will have control of your breathing, but the 
depending on if you're doing unconscious or conscious or voluntary control, you're going to go ahead and activate different parts of the brain. So on your PowerPoint right here, I've highlighted for you that if you're doing unconscious breathing, so this is the breathing where you're not thinking about inhaling or exhaling, which is what we do most of the time, it's going to go ahead and involve the medulla oblongata and the pons. If you're going to do voluntary control, meaning that you're going to do the forced inhale, forced exhale, then you're going to go ahead and recruit the neurons in your motor cortex. For your exam, I can guarantee you that there will be a question that will ask you which part of the brain is involved with either unconscious breathing or voluntary control. So that's one of the reasons why I bolded it and I highlighted it. So the medulla oblongata and the pons are for the unconscious breathing. And for voluntary control, we're going to use our motor cortex. Now, we also see that in order to inhale, we're going to have to rely on inspiratory neurons. So these neurons are going to fire off and they're going to cause a cascading reaction that will ultimately allow us to inhale. And part of their action is to go ahead and stimulate the muscles like the diaphragm to go ahead and to contract. Expiratory neurons, which are neurons that are involved with exhaling, only come into play when you're doing forced expiration. And the reason for that is during a normal exhale, we see that all we're really doing is we're just resetting the muscles, right? You have to stimulate the muscles so that they can contract so that you can inhale. Well, when the muscle contracted, then the next step is for it to relax. And when it naturally relaxes, then you naturally exhale as well. If, however, you want to do a forced expiration, so you want to do a forceful exhale, you want to scream, you want to sing, you want to cough, then we're going to have to activate expiratory neurons. So only during forced expiration do you activate your expiratory neurons, but during every inhale, you activate your inspiratory neurons. And as you can see, you have the phrenic nerve, which continuously stimulates the diaphragm, and the intercostal nerves that interacts with the intercostal muscles, which means that they're continuously telling those muscles to contract so that it can keep up with our inhalation and when it resets, our exhalation pattern. We can also adjust our breathing rates depending on what is received through the sensory system. So for instance, anytime pain or emotion comes into the way, we see that the lymphatic system and the hypothalamus can adjust our breathing rate. I think we've all had a moment in time where we do what I like to call our ugly cry, when you're just overwhelmed with emotion and you're trying to talk and inhale and exhale all at the same time, and you just find yourself <laughs> going like this. Okay, that's a really weird sound. I apologize for that. But either way, we could see that we can adjust our breathing pattern, you know, anytime we have an emotional event. We also see that we can have bronchial constriction, which the bronchioles become smaller in their lumen, making it harder for air to flow, as well as a coughing reflex anytime there's like an, an irritant or a pathogen that's in our respiratory tract. Um, we also see that there's cases where if you do excessive inhale, you activate a, um, an excessive inflation uh, reflex, which basically will stop your inspiration pattern and will forcefully slow down your breathing pattern. Um, we also know that at all times as part of our homeostasis, we have chemoreceptors near our blood vessels that will continuously monitor the pH of blood carbon dioxide, and oxygen levels. And um, in part two of our lecture, part of what we have to talk about is how your carbon dioxide levels are linked to the overall pH that you can find both in your blood and your cerebral spinal fluid. So that means that your respiratory rate will play a role in pH regulation as well. All right, now this is our last slide for part one, and it basically just reminds you that you do have voluntary control of your breathing pattern. And as I mentioned to you before, it's going to be controlled by the motor cortex. But this slide highlights the fact that your voluntary control is limited, um, and that basically means that your body or your motor cortex can take over inhaling and exhaling, so for a voluntary basis, as long as you keep your carbon dioxide and your oxygen levels homeostatic. 
if the body notices that these levels start to fluctuate and they become abnormal, it will go ahead and limit your voluntary control and switch over to unconscious control of your breathing pattern. So there's only so much you can do voluntarily before the rest of the brain takes over and controls your breathing pattern again. And it all does this to make sure that your CO2, your carbon dioxide levels, and your oxygen levels are within homeostatic range. So I added the little illustration that says what to do when kids hold their breath, right? So some kids will have a rebellious streak, and if they, you don't let them do what they want to do, they'll say, well, I'll hold my breath. Hmm. Now, when they're holding their breath, that's part of voluntary control, so that's the motor cortex, and the body will allow them to do that. That is until it notices that there's no fresh oxygen coming in and too much carbon dioxide is coming, is staying inside the body. So what happens with the kid holding their breath? Is it dangerous? Will the kid die? Nope. Eventually what you're going to see is that the kid might turn a little blue and they might collapse and pass out, but that's all in an effort for the respiratory system to kind of switch back over to unconscious control of the breathing and thereby restoring the oxygen and carbon dioxide. So I guess next time a kid says they're going to hold their breath till they die, I say you look at them and say, do it. Okay, I'm just joking. Please don't do that. This is one of the reasons why I don't have any children. <laughs> All right. Um, and purpose of the slide is you have limited control over your voluntary control. Be nice to the children. All right, guys. Um, we'll talk soon for part two.